everyone. Good afternoon. Um, I hope you guys are all, everyone is able to hear me just well. Um, and so it's my pleasure to introduce um, for today's Grand Rounds, uh, Dr. Juanita Merchant. And so Dr. Merchant is very accomplished. Uh, she completed her medical school uh, and PhD at Yale University. She graduated from her internal medicine residency at Mass General Hospital and then completed her gastroenterology fellowship at the University of California, Los Angeles. She currently serves as professor and chief of the Division of Gastroenterology and Hepatology at the University of Arizona in Tucson. Dr. Merchant's extensive research includes multiple topics in gastroenterology with a particular focus on gastrointestinal malignancies and was recently awarded the Distinguished Mentor Award from the AGA in 2020. Dr. Merchant's presentation today is entitled TLR9 Variants and Predicting Complications from H. pylori Infection. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Merchant virtually to Miami. Well, thank you for that kind introduction. Uh, and so today I'm gonna to talk about some new data that hopefully uh, will be a little further along once we get to DDW uh, in San Diego, but I wanted to try it out on this group. So this is somewhat of a, a new talk, but um, I'll give you some background leading up to why we're starting to look at these toll-like receptors. Okay, and I guess I have to click on that. Okay, so the learning objectives uh, today or I'll start out relatively slowly um, with some of the uh, reviewing some of the clinical complications of H. pylori infection and who's at risk. And then I will delve a little deeper into a lot of the um, mouse models and molecular biology uh, that we've been using to try to understand how the micro, the immune microenvironment um, is altered by Helicobacter infection and uh, shifts the mucosa more toward metaplasia and eventually gastric cancer. Okay, so this slide is a schematic cartoon of the, um, actually of the original um, PREA paradigm, which I'll show you in another form in a few minutes, but it's just really to emphasize that about half the world's infected with um, Helicobacter pylori, and I think a recent um, uh, review article mentioned is about 4.4 billion people infected with uh, Helicobacter. Um, if you're infected, you can uh, develop a essentially an asymptomatic uh, gastritis or inflammation of the stomach. And this is probably the, the step where uh, if patients do develop dyspepsia and symptoms, we'll do a breath test or a, a um, fecal stool antigen, determine that they're positive for helicobacter, and then they'll be treated with antibiotics to try to bring the mucosa back to homeostasis and eradicate the organism. And that is so that we can prevent these uh, more serious complications, such as GI bleeding from a typically a, a duodenal ulcer, but also possibly a gastric ulcer. Um, and about five to 20% of uh, subjects that are infected can develop this more acute uh, um, uh, complication of helicobacter infection. We don't see um, perforation as much anymore. We usually are able to, uh, patients present with GI bleeding, are able to cauterize and stop that. However, there is this, um, I believe, a toggle switch where there are some patients that will go on to develop more of an asymptomatic chronic inflammatory process, whether they may just have some dyspepsia and they never really come to medical um, therapy, uh, but they eventually develop what's called multifocal atrophic gastritis. So atrophy, I'll talk about a little bit later, essentially means that you're losing the acid secreting, the differentiated state of the stomach. So that acid secreting cell population, the parietal cells, but also eventually what are called the chief cells that make um, pepsinogen. And uh, once this is more of a pan um, gastritis with atrophy, this seems to signal um, a, a deterioration of the epithelium to intestinal metaplasia, and I'll show you a picture of that, dysplasia, and then eventually, eventually about one to two uh, or one to three percent of patients will develop um, gastric adenocarcinoma. Um, 
So here um, I have included the um, really seminal article from Pelea Correa in which he developed this paradigm based upon epidemiologic um, studies that he was doing in Colombia, South America. And this is at least 10 years before the discovery of helicobacter, but he observed that patients that were developing um, cancer um, had a uh, precursor uh, lesions of this inflammatory process that led to atrophy, as I mentioned early, earlier, loss of the differentiated state of the stomach, and then replacement of the parietal cells and the chief cells with this mucus phenotype, uh, what I'm categorizing here in general as metaplasias, because as you'll see, there's sort of different flavors of metaplasia. And so um, in humans, this transition from the chronic inflammatory process to atrophy can take years. So um, that's really has been the advantage of using our mouse models because we can actually determine what is time zero, i.e. when we infect the, the mice with helicobacter. We don't know in many instances when people are infected, particularly when we see them as adults. It's thought that um, children are infected, that this is gonna be a familial spread. And so that's how it actually sort of stays in the population. And so people may be harboring this organism from childhood. So again, here are the percentages of those infected, those that develop the metaplasia and then developing cancer. There are other risk factors such as high salt and nitrates, also mismatch re uh, repair uh, um, high, and Epstein-Barr virus is the other pathogen that is important to think about. But um, I think all of those sort of pale in comparison to really studying the setting of um, the infection with Helicobacter pylori. So I've emphasized here that this, there's this tipping point between the inflammation that we may be able to re resolve by eradicating the organism versus the, or the um, epithelium now moving more toward cancer. So um, I wanted to highlight a dilemma that um, many of us as gastroenterologists always deal with. And I think some of the um, uh, family uh, medicine and um, uh, internal medicine um, uh, uh, physicians will deal with where you have those that are infected with helicobacter pylori. So this is a patient that I had that was a Hispanic female um, that was complaining of dys, uh, dyspepsia. She was referred directly by her PCP for endoscopy, which I ended up doing and uh, saw some you know, redness in the stomach and she was on chronic uh, PPI. She also had GERD, uh, and that's why she was on the PPIs. Uh, and so I um, note, noted that the um, uh, the, uh, the stomach was inflamed. And so I biopsied actually both the corpus and the, the antrum. There were no um, ulcers that were identified. Um, however, the pathology report came back showing antral metaplasia in the corpus with endocrine hyperplasia. So kind of a mouthful to say, okay, she had some metaplastic changes. And so the problem becomes, you know, what do I do with this patient? You know, should I survey them? Um, and, uh, you know, the, the progression to um, gastric cancer is what we're usually concerned about and when, how often do we survey these patients. So who is at risk for, in, um, uh, for H. pylori induced uh, uh, non-cardiac gastric adenocarcinoma? So I've included um, this article, which I think um, the residents in particular should take a look at. It's actually more of an editorial review article um, uh, from uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Samir Gupta at UC San Diego, who led this um, uh, editorial group. And essentially it's just emphasizing that um, the cancer that is developing around the cardia, and I won't, you know, we can save this for questions, but cardia, the cardia part of the stomach is almost synonymous with the, the lower part of the, the esophagus, but it's, it has the um, gastric epithelium. So those cancers tend to be more prevalent and associated with GERD, obesity, and um, with uh, non-Hispanic whites. However, um, the gastric cancer that develops in the body, and in particular up until the 1960s and 70s, um, it was primarily in the antrum, but now we're seeing it more in the body, possibly due to PPI use. Uh, those um, patients tend to be 
uh, underrepresented minorities, lower socioeconomic status. Um, also out of uh, UC San Diego from uh, Dr. Shaw uh, was a nice article also emphasizing the racial disparities in gastric cancer. Again, emphasizing that cancer here in the cardia um, with the exception of um, the uh, Japanese and Korean Americans, um, they tend to be um, primarily in uh, non-Hispanic whites um, and they have the uh, more higher incidence of the uh, gastric cancer here, um, very close to the esophagus. Whereas you can see here in general, um, H. pylori, as well as some of the other uh, less studied risk factors tend to be higher in uh, the uh, Asian population, but also in uh, Hispanics and uh, non-Hispanic uh, African-Americans. And we see here in uh, Arizona about a four, also a similar increased risk in uh, the, not, uh, the, in the uh, Native American population, primarily uh, in Navajo. So um, I wanted to highlight another article that came out of the Vanderbilt group last year where um, they actually inherited a lot of the samples from Pelea Correa um, and the studies in, um, and samples from Columbia, South America. And this was a really interesting uh, Colombian chemo prevention trial where they followed patients over 20 years and found that uh, if they, they actually had 800 adults that were in, enrolled um, uh, with uh, precancerous lesions, so chronic atrophic gastritis or metaplasia, they followed these patients over 20 years and assessed their uh, development of gastric adenocarcinoma and uh, web whether the type of metaplasia seemed to predict uh, gastric adenocarcinoma. And what I thought found very interesting was that um, certainly um, a H. pylori negative status was beneficial. So again, what we're trying to do it was just to eradicate the or organism if possible. But here they really emphasize the different flavors of metaplasia and that subjects with metaplasia, intestinal metaplasia or dysplasia at baseline were likely to progress if the intestinal metaplasia was incomplete or metaplasia was located in the corpus. So I want to emphasize, because we don't usually think about this, and I know here in Arizona, in many instances, the pathologists do not give us a readout. We have to go back and ask them, is this intestinal or colonic type, which is what the complete and incomplete metaplasia are the, the other terms for that. And so what you'll see here with the intestinal type, you see that classic goblet cell that is characteristic of the small intestine. And so the way I like to think of the term metaplasia, it's a pathologic term. You have to have biopsies to make this call. It's a normal cell, i.e. an intestinal cell in the wrong place, in the stomach. And of course, we look at it in the esophagus. And you'll also see here that there's some panic cells. So that's the complete or intestinal type of metaplasia. The colonic or incomplete metaplasia is what's more strongly associated with um, uh, adenocarcinoma, and this has actually been known for years, but I thought that that Columbia study really highlighted that again um, in their recent study. And you can see that the um, metaplastic change um, is more of a foamy type of mucus cell um, that's present and not always the fully formed goblet cells and the panic cells. So that's why when we biopsy patients to try to survey or even make the diagnosis of whether they have pan um, gastritis and atrophy, uh, we should be biopsying um, in two places in the antrum, the incisura, which is actually this um, part of the lesser curve, which is uh, it's thought where the stem cells of the stomach arise, and then also in the corpus in two places, lesser and greater curvature. And so that's what, why if you um, what I emphasized in the previous study from Columbia, that they saw a strong association if you see the inflammation and atrophy up here in the corpus. And really you want to put these in two different bottles to make sure that um, uh, we can confirm that indeed you have these changes in the antrum and in the corpus. I think here to save money, in many instances, we dump everything in the same bottle, but if, the, if there is already atrophy and metaplasia in the corpus, you're not gonna be able to tell the difference if they're all in the same bottle. So here, um, 
to summarize um, some of the uh, uh, recommendations really that have been uh, promoted by uh, the European collective uh, is that with dysplasia documented, so if it's high grade dysplasia uh, that comes back on the biopsies that we should be um, uh, surveying and repeating that in six months, 12 months for low grade dysplasia, and that what about patients that don't show any, just show intestinal metaplasia and or they have some family history, then there is the uh, discussion, at least from the Europeans, that we should be um, uh, surveying about every three years. Um, and this is um, including patients with intestinal metaplasia at a single location, plus a family history of gastric cancer or intest uh, incomplete intestinal metaplasia or persistent HP gastritis. So many of us will have patients where we can't eradicate. I have a patient like that. So I'm probably going to be bringing her back every two to three years. And then um, here, um, if you have pan gastritis that you want to um, survey every three years. So um, unfortunately in the U.S., and if you look through some of the AGA um, recommendations, um, it, because it's not, has not been demonstrated to be cost effective, there is not a general recommendation to survey here in the US and that's mainly because of the uh, non-Hispanic white um, population. There's a decrease in the incidence of, of uh, gastric cancer um, in the body and in the antrum. However, for non-white populations, so underrepresented minorities, as you saw in those um, previous slides, um, and also probably first generation um, Asian populations that have recently immigrated from uh, countries where it's endemic that we did, do need to endoscopically screen. Um, and if uh, metaplasia is detected, then again, to perform surveillance in that subset. So I wanted to emphasize this for students and, and residents um, because it's not uh, immediately obvious why there is this hoopla around metaplasia. And it really came out of the studies linking Barrett's esophagus to esophageal adenocarcinoma. And as you know, and this was um, studied in, and, and, and uh, defined in the 1980s that chronic reflux esophagitis, so GERD, can lead to intestinal metaplasia of the esophagus, so this Barrett's esophagus, and that was initially shown to be linked to an adenocarcinoma. We then went back and ask that same question about intestinal metaplasia in the stomach. And that, so that is why it wasn't until the 1990s that we start to make the association between intestinal metaplasia in the stomach and gastric adenocarcinoma. So in short, chronic inflammation starts to put some type of um, pressure on the epithelial cells to kind of respond to this, we think chronic injury um, resulting in a intestinal cell in the wrong place, i.e. in the stomach, which is a precursor lesion for adenocarcinoma. I'm not going to have time to get into, um, you know, the different types of adenocarcinoma, but I'll just say that diffuse type of adenocarcinoma, uh, I'm sorry, well, diffuse type of gastric cancer does not typically go through that metaplast, atrophy metaplastic stage. So that's probably a discussion for another day in terms of how we're starting to understand that process. So the caveats are like esophageal metaplasia, the intervals for surveillance are not firm, for its, you know, for Barrett's it tends to be every three years, but it's the the data here in the states has not been as as, as strong, and so there isn't the recommendation. So the question will be, you know, whether insurance companies are going to follow the pay for you know frequent surveillance like they do for Barrett's. Um, so and there are fewer control studies. Okay. So I'm going to switch gears a bit and start to, to delve more into what is it about this chronic inflammation that helicobacter pylori initiates. So of course there is, as I mentioned, the acute um, inflammatory response, which tends to be a Th1, Th17 type of immune cell response in which these types of cytokines, pro-inflammatory cytokines are produced. So this is the stage that we think of in terms of eradicating, treating with antibiotics. 
But at the same time, there are lower levels of these immune suppressor types of cells. Um, but during the chronic phase, these cells will start to predominate. So we're sort of going to lay out a lot of um, the studies that we've been involved in. We are interested in trying to understand what is it about the immune microenvironment triggered by Helicobacter. Now, there is evidence that as you move more toward metaplasia, that you uh, that the organism actually goes away, and there's um, some other data that suggests that once you actually have cancer, the organism is not there. So there is a lot of interest and discussion about whether what is continu continuing to propel the immune microenvironment forward and putting pressure on the epithelium to change is actually Helicobacter itself or it's the change in the microbiome and that uh, the gastric microbiome and there are other organisms that are taking over. Because as you know, once Helicobacter um, causes the um, atrophy, you're gonna see a rise in the pH of the stomach. And so other organisms, so Helicobacter actually loses its acidic niche that it likes to live in and other organisms can take over. And so that's actually an important point that is under, um, under study. So in humans, this can take um, years to occur. Um, and so by the time you get to the chronic phase, which as I showed you with my patient, you may um, not even be able to detect helicobacter, but they've got this sort of chronic smoldering inflammatory response in which the dominant immune cells are something called myeloid derived suppressor cells, tumor associated macrophages, M2. So, anyway, I can go on, but they are associated with a certain type of um, cytokine secretion. And early on, you can see now um, over 10 years ago, um, LOMR's group in, in the UK actually started to associate specific cytokines based upon polymorphisms in one of these pro-inflammatory, pro-carcinogenic cytokines called IL-1 beta and showed that that was strongly associated with, um, with gastric adenocarcinoma. Um, Tim Wong's group um, now at Columbia um, uh, demonstrated that if you overexpress IL-1 beta in the mouse mucosa that you can develop tumors. So I'm going to make a segue here into this concept of, um, I have a tale of two organs, but really that's because the cardia we're not really going to be talking about. That is more of the sort of comes under the purview of um, the more of the esophageal adenocarcinoma uh, and there's a lot of work going on now to, to suggest that the um, origins of cardiac cancer may be similar to Barrett's esophagus and esophageal adenocarcinoma. So we're focused on more of this um, uh, immune um, environment that's triggered by helicobacter that transitions through the metaplastic step. We started to look at hedgehog signaling and that was an important segue into us now really focused on the plasticity, the shifting of the immune microenvironment. Um, once those uh, immune cells come to the stomach initially to fight off Helicobacter, but over time, if they sit there, they change their phenotype. And that is important and correlates with the metaplastic sure. and eventual, eventually the trans, uh, the, um, the uh, epithelial change toward cancer. So again, taking advantage of the um, Correa paradigm, we're interested in, we began, became interested in the step between chronic inflammation and the atrophy and metaplastic changes and asked the question about the role of hedgehog signaling really because of one report from the, uh, a group at Harvard in which they knocked out the ligand for sonic hedgehog, which I'll show you in a, a second, um, sort of the hedgehog pathway. And they reported that these mice had metaplasia. And that was really the impetus for us asking the question whether hedgehog might be involved. So what you see here is the um, focus on the fact that the epithelial cells, particularly um, the parietal cells, make a large quantity of one of the three major ligands in mammalian tissues called sonic hedgehog. And sonic hedgehog then, um, when it is secreted by these cells, is detected by a stromal cell, 
And what you'll see, we've been looking at the myeloid cell in particular. Um, sonic hedgehog is initially recognized by a receptor on the receiving cell called patched. Patched tends to keep another transmembrane receptor called smoothin in an inhibitory state. It, it, it also, when the uh, pathway is off, this molecule called Glee, and there's actually three flavors of it in mammalian cells, um, sits in the cytoplasm. So when the ligand engages the receptor, this inhibitory step uh, uh, influence is removed from smoothin and allows the transcription factor to migrate to the nucleus, turning on a um, program of pro-proliferative genes that are regulated by Glee. So, so quickly, some, we, some of our earlier work um, was focused on which cells in the stomach actually made sonic hedgehog. And as I mentioned earlier, so what we can do with our mouse models is we can actually label the cells genetically. And this is an example showing here that um, we can uh, use this um, gene, which when you give it substrate, will turn whatever cells are expressing this gene blue. So these are all the cells that are expressing the sonic hedgehog gene. And you can see here the in the mouse stomach, the upper part of the stomach or the corpus tends to make a large amount of sonic hedgehog, seems to spare quite um, well the antrum of the stomach. And what we did is we just showed that when you do co-localization with markers for the different cell populations, particularly here, HKTPase for the parietal cells, which are shown here, um, that they make a large amount of sonic hedgehog. So I won't go into some of the studies that we've done looking at hedgehog in the homeostasis of the stomach, but I wanted to move forward with, we then asked the question, what cells were responding to the hedgehog signal? And this was work that was done by Mo El Zatari when he was in the lab. And again, we took advantage of these reporter mice in which this gene that can turn a substrate blue was um, knocked into the locus, the mouse locus of D1, which is one of the uh, transcription factors, which is an important readout for hedgehog signaling. And so um, he looked at these mice under acute um, or the absence of infection and then two months after helicobacter infection. So I'll just emphasize, you'll see something um, H velus or HF because we tend to use velus instead of pylori in the mouse models because we get a much more robust inflammatory response um, when we infect with felis. And what you see here is that in the resting state, that the cells that are expressing um, alpha smooth mus muscle actin, which are the myofibroblast cell populations, are the ones that are exclusively expressing um, the, the um, transcription factor and are able to respond to hedgehog signaling. However, um, during the acute phase of helicobacter infection, you'll see that there are these other cells that start to infiltrate the stomach which when we do flow cytometry, we can document that these are actually myeloid cells shown here with their uh, respective markers. So um, what I've shown you is that we started to ask the question, what is the import importance of hedgehog signaling in this transition from chronic inflammation to um, atrophy and metaplasia? Um, what I've shown you is that um, the Glee one, the, the cells that are responding to hedgehog signaling during a helicobacter infection during the acute phase are cells that are expressing Glee one and they tend to be myeloid cells. So because of the way the um, Glee one mice were set up, so where the laxi was knocked into the locus, we actually completely abolished the native uh, natural expression of Glee one in these mice. And so Mo let these mice go the full um, uh, six months, and I'll say full six months because it's at six months that in wild type mice, they develop this metaplastic change. Our mouse models, when they are infected with helicobacter, do not go all the way to gastric cancer. We never see gastric cancer, but they, they kind of stop at this metaplastic stage, which we call SPIM, 
And I'll just say what the name is, but it's not really that important. It's, it's really a marker for metaplastic changes. So spasmolytic polypeptide expressing metaplasia is what we call it. And we can use immunofluorescent markers. So in this case, this green um, labeled lectin to identify the metaplastic changes in the mouse stomach in the corpus. The HKTPAs in mice marks, of course, the um, parietal cells, which you can see here, they're absent here, so you know that there's atrophy. Intrinsic factor in the mouse, but not in humans, marks the chief cells, so you can see that even the chief cells are starting to go away. However, in the mice where we maintain them in the um, GLE-1 heterozygous uh, null or homozygous null state, we do not see the disruption of the architecture, the cellular epithelial architecture of the stomach. Now, if I, I'll show you later, if you look at the H&E, there's plenty of inflammation there, but these cells, as you know, those only the immune cells are really making GLE-1. So we found this really interesting that an immune cell that is responding to hedgehog signaling seemed to be required for this metaplastic change. And if you disrupt even one copy that you can prevent this metaplastic change in the mouse. So, uh oh, hopefully this will not, um, it's a little chatter there, um, will not freeze up on me. So what you basically see is that, hmm, let's go back. Anyway, trying to move forward here. Anyway, um, ooh. Oh, okay. I was frozen. Um, so what you basically see, I kind of skipped over um, a little bit of the summary, but I can just make the point here is that what we were able to show is that by using that mouse model infected with helicobacter, if you disrupt glee, you don't get the meta, you don't progress onto this metaplastic change, even though there's inflammation there. So being a Molecular biologist and transcription factor aficionado, I knew what to do next, which was to essentially use this transcription factor to identify other genes that were downstream that were required, that required this transcription factor and were necessary for this metaplastic change. And so at the time, uh, this is now, you know, about six or seven years ago, um, we used microarray analysis um, and then. Um, this is actually a picture of the heat map showing that in the GLEE-1 null mice that you see several genes that I'm showing here, there's a whole laundry list of genes that are changing. But in particular, we started to look at this gene called Schlafen, which means to sleep in German. But um, Schlafen-4, you can see in the GLEE-1 null mice does not come on since, um, this is actually looking at the RNA uh, levels. We can confirm that the RNA levels were down, but because um, this was found in the GLE-1 null mice, the question is whether this gene to be regulated or turn on needed this transcription factor and whether this transcription factor actually sits on the promoter of this gene. And so we use something called chromatin immunoprecipitation to document that. Having a little trouble. Okay, and so essentially we use the transcription factor to identify a variety of genes, but we decided to move forward with Schlafen 4 because it's known that this particular um, gene, and actually it's a family of genes that's important in myeloid cell differentiation. So we then made additional tools, which are shown here, relatively complex, but um, just to take you through it, basically, we are able to take the promoter of Schlafen 4, hook it up to another gene called CRE-ERT2. We breed this mouse to another mouse that will allow the cells that are expressing this gene to turn red, fluorescently red. And we can also do additional genetic engineering so that only the immune cells that are expressing this gene will turn red by doing a bone marrow transplant of the hybrid from uh, this um, breeding of these two mice together. 
So it's a very complicated experiment, which you can read about if you're interested in the details. But essentially, once we transferred the bone marrow from this hybrid mouse into wild type or mice that were overexpressing sonic hedgehog, we then infected them with helicobacter and then did a full-time course for six months. So you can see very involved experiment to essentially lineage trace where the cells were coming from. Why did we overexpress um, sonic hedgehog? And this is a time course showing you why. So at two months, four months, and six months, you can see here the H and E staining for the stomach, um, the mouse stomach, where you can see a little bit of inflammatory uh, inflammation in the mice that are overexpressing sonic hedgehog, but not the wild type mice. And then by four months, so we were able to accelerate the metaplastic change by two months by overexpressing sonic hedgehog in these mice. And you can see here, these clear cells are the metaplastic change that I was talking about. Um, you can see there's plenty of inflammation there, um, but even the wild type mice at four months don't show any, um, uh, any metaplastic change. But by six months, both groups of mice will show the metaplastic change. So we were able, therefore, to use the wild type four month infected mice and compare them to the sonic hedgehog overexpressing mice at four months. And what I've highlighted here, showing here in high power view, is that those bright red cells are immune cells that we are able to now track because we initially put this hybrid um, uh, gene um, mixture into the bone marrow. So we're only tracking cells that are coming out of the bone marrow that are immune cells. So that's what we mean by lineage trace. And again, I don't have time to go into the full details, but we were able to type these cells by flow cytometry and also um, stain their nucleus to see, show that they actually had a granulocytic nucleus and that they had biochemical function, which we were able to show even using T cell suppressor assays to demonstrate that these cells um, were what are called myeloid derived suppressor cells of the granulocytic type. So an important point, um, which will become um, relevant later, what you'll see is that um, the hedgehog signal is absolutely required for Schlafen 4, for this promoter to be maximally activated. So what you see here, if we take immune cells from wild type mice and incubate them with just sonic hedgehog alone, with H. felis alone, or the two together, so here the two together, we get a 30-fold induction compared to only a three to five-fold induction if you incubate these immune cells with um, sonic hedgehog or helicobacter alone. But note that if you treat these cells with interferon alpha, so a type 1 interferon, you get an 800-fold induction. So the maximal uh, response of the Schlafen promoter, you need interferon alpha. And most importantly, if you use a Glee 1 null mouse, you do not see this induction. So to summarize, essentially you need, Glee 1 is required but it's not sufficient to turn this promoter on. And, oh, sorry. <laughs> so, it's a problem with having an old computer. Uh, so we were, So the way you want to think about the Schlafen signal and the cells, those immune, immune cells that are expressing that signal is that um, hedgehog signaling is a constitutive signal. This promoter can't be activated by type 1 interferons without hedgehog engaging the promoter. So that's one key. The second key, the maximal and the inducible signal comes from type 1 interferon, so interferon alpha. 
We then work backwards knowing that this promoter is turned on by interferon alpha to identify the fact that um, the, what is the source of interferon alpha, which happens to be activation typically of toll-like receptor 9, activated by damaged activated molecular patterns. And there is a whole cascade that occurs in the different cell populations. Plasmacytoid dendritic cells tend to be, which is an antigen producing uh, presenting cell, tends to be the cell population that is most responsive to um, um, damage activated molecular patterns and will produce interferon alpha. So essentially, you can see we use hedgehog signaling to identify these immune cells and found that this cell population is most, act, uh, most strongly activated in the presence of type 1 interferons, but still requires hedgehog signaling. So that's summarized here, chronic inflammation. We believe uh, the that time, um, that delay, whatever it, it, you know, in patients, it could be 10, 20, 30, we don't know how many years it's going to take, but we think it requires the accumulation of these damage activated molecular patterns over time, which then accumulate and can activate these endocytic toll-like receptors. And then once TLR9 is activated, there again is a cascade, which involves, I didn't show here, MITE88, uh, interferon beta, IRF7, and then interferon alpha. And it's what we are looking at is way downstream, the activation of these signals. So um, one of the, and some of the newer data that we've been working on is trying to understand which cells in the inflamed gastric mucosa are actually responding to um, or, or, or triggering the TLR9 activation. So I'm actually, this is a schematic diagram of essentially some of the, I, and I'll probably skip through a lot of the details of the data, but essentially what we're asking the question is whether helicobacter infection in the gastric, um, uh, in the gastric mucosa and dendritic cells tend to send those processes up into the lumen uh, and our antigen presenting cells, but the long and short of it is what we find is that even the gastric epithelial cells um, have toll-like receptors and can activate this same pathway. And we were able to use organoids from both mouse and um, what I didn't include in this presentation, also from human biopsies um, that we can show um, uh, that the uh, helicobacter is activating um, this toll-like receptor um, 9 pathway to produce uh, interferon alpha. So um, just to give you a little flavor for the data, so um, this is uh, under revision um, for gastroenterology. So we showed that um, here that in the uninfected uh, mouse, uh, and this is, um, we're going to infect the mice for two months, what you can see here staining in red is um, for uh, cells that are expressing toll-like receptor 9. And um, in green, um, those cells expressing interferon alpha. And so what you can see here um, is that here in the corpus is that um, of this mouse model is that the parietal cells are strongly expressing TLR9. Now there are a few other cells in here, but you'll also see these cells, which we know are immune cells by flow cytometry, and they also are producing interferon alpha. So these, we think that these are probably the plasmacytoid dendritic cells. But what was really interesting is that the, the antrum on the mouse um, did not seem to be responding. And this is actually... Um, some of the nuances that we are really interested in and in trying to understand, what is it about the corpus that tended to be a little bit more responsive? And we hope to be able to translate this into looking at biopsies from an organoids that we generate from the human corpus of the stomach and the antra. But it seems like the um, activation is more strongly um, identified in the corpus this is a busy slide, and so I'm really going to hit a few of the highlights just to show you that
both the epithelial cells, and this is again using mouse organoids from the antrum and the corpus where we can obviously easily separate that, and dendritic cells that we can flow sort from the bone marrow, we can polarize them and we do basically trans well uh, analyses. Um, and so essentially you see here a Western blot for TLR9 with uh, a little bit stronger activation quantified here um, in the corpus. Here in some of the downstream signaling molecules are activated, but dendritic cells also can respond to helicobacter either directly or in conjunction with the presence of an epithelial cell, i.e. the antral or corpus organoids. So I'm going to jump over here because of time, because this is really the summary. So essentially what I showed you is that the epithelial cells have the machinery to respond to damage activated molecular pathways, activate this pathway and produce interferon alpha. However, what all of this is showing here by flow cytometry is that the plasmacytoid dendritic cell still makes more of the interferon alpha per cell. And that's essentially what this is showing. And I won't go into, because I know it's busy, but I did want to point out here that we looked at the tissue, antrum and corpus versus the serum. This, these processes are going on in the tissue. It's not about what gets released into the serum. And then finally, here showing the setup where we are, the organoids will sit here. We will infect um, with helicobacter in the upper well, and then we can collect in this, um, the conditioned media from uh, this region uh, where the dendritic cells are uh, potentially sensing whatever this interaction is um, happening here. So this really is just to say, and again, because of time, I just wanted to emphasize that we can block using um, basically another DNA type of molecule called ODN2088. That's an inhibitor of toll-like receptor nine and show that we can reduce the production of interferon alpha. So here baseline dendritic cells alone, dendritic cells cultured with corpus organoids, you get about 3% um, uh, production of interferon alpha. In, in the presence of H. felis, you induce the uh, production of interferon alpha, but if you block um, in this uh, system, with the TLR9 inhibitor, you can reduce that uh, almost back to baseline. And essentially, this is actually demonstrating that this, that this plasmacytoid dendritic cell, again, is probably the major cell that's producing most of the interferon. Okay, as I promised, hopefully in one or two minutes, to explain about this, these toll-like receptor uh, 9 polymorphisms, because essentially, this is a way for us to translate and try to start to understand and maybe even screen patients for those that might be more strongly responding to these damage activated molecular patterns during a chronic uh, helicobacter infection. And so what um, the toll-like receptor SNP that was actually in the literature already um, and was known to increase NF-kappa-B production or expression, but we've gone further and shown that this particular SNP sits in the human promoter of TLR9 at minus 1247. There's another SNP that's very close that you would consider is also in linkage, which I'll show you, does not um, bind, um, uh, does not convert uh, the, um, the, the, the SNP is not a, uh, an NF-kappa B binding site. So we use this other SNP as a control. Um, this is just showing you um, that we could use TNF-alpha to generate um, an increase in um, cells that were producing TLR9. Actually, this is not TLR9. This is uh, a missed uh, typo. This is NF-kappa B that we're um, doing a Western blot for. And so here we use something called gel shifts or electrophoretic mobility shift assays to actually show that NF-kappa B is binding to the um, promoter element when you have the minor allele, a C allele, instead of the T allele. So here, 
when we make the probe using the C allele, we get binding of N of kappa B. But if the T allele, which is the major allele, is present, you don't get N of kappa B binding. And we can prove that that's N of kappa B by using antibody to disrupt this complex. And we have some, um, in a retrospective analysis of samples from, uh, that I had stored in the freezer, um, long story, <laughs> I won't get into the story, but uh, from Vietnam and also in collaboration with some uh, gastroenterologists from China, we actually are able to take the paraffin tissue and scrape that off and do sequencing of the genomic DNA to identify um, whether um, the uh, biopsies from these patients tended to have the only the T allele or carried a C allele or both of the C alleles, which is relatively rare. And the, and the long and short of it is that we found that patients that had atrophy and had active helicobacter infection or had meta, also had metaplasia um, had a more um, um, had a higher frequency of the C allele, and that was statistically significant. Similarly, the Chinese cohort samples that we had were actual gastric cancer sa samples, and indeed, we also found that they had a higher incidence of the minor allele, which forms an N of kappa B binding site. This is actually the control for that, just showing that this other allele that is about 200 um, base pairs um, upstream of um, the, um, the other SNP did not show any um, correlation. And here, probably a little bit hard to see, but it's quantified here that essentially in the patients that had um, the high, the more of the C allele that, um, and showed atrophy or metaplasia, that we saw a higher um, expression level staining the tissues um, for um, expression of TLR9 protein, interferon alpha, and then actually a marker, which I don't have time to get into, uh, a marker for the myeloid derived suppressor cells. So um, I'm going to end with this slide um, so that we have a few uh, time for a little bit of questions. Essentially, what we're saying is that the, we've traced the hedgehog signaling pathway to find that um, the uh, microenvironment, the immune microenvironment um, is changing with chronic infection. We think that this is due to the accumulation of these damage activated molecular patterns, of which, uh, of which I've listed some here. This tends to polarize or change the phenotype of the cells that have already been recruited to the stomach. And it's these cells that can inhibit T cell function, but can also secrete molecules that can also stimulate the metaplastic change. So um, I don't have time to get into that, but I'm just going to put up my acknowledgement slide. Lynn Ding really has led all of these studies um, since she, and she followed me here nicely to Arizona. And thank you for your attention and hopefully we have time for a few questions. Thank you, Dr. Merchant. That was a very elegant translational talk to show us the beauty of utilizing mouse models and other models to study human disease. That was really very nice. Can you, as people are putting together their questions. Can you just comment on what you think is likely to be the result uh, in terms of either prevention of the development of this metaplasia given un our understanding of the molecular basis of the uh, inflammatory component to it uh, in terms of adjunct therapy in patients that have been diagnosed with H. pylori? So I, I think in terms of trying to reverse the metaplasia, I, you know, that, that's still controversial. It looks like from the Columbia um, study that maybe if you're at the, just the complete, you still have the differentiated cell population of the, you know, intestinal cell type, you might be able to reverse that. Now, whether you can just reverse it um, with antibiotic treatment, that's another question um, because in many instances, helicobacter is no longer there. So that's in a way the impetus for trying to understand what are the cell populations and what would be the targets to inhibit the inflammatory response as opposed to dealing with the organism. And that's some of the things um, that we've been looking at in our mouse models and you know, we're raising the question TLR9, 
Can we block the activation of that pathway? We're even looking at um, ways to block um, Schlafen. So we've even done a knockout of Schlafen, which I didn't have time to go into. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Yeah. yeah. Juanita, Maria. it's Maria. <laughs> Hello. I, I, I talked about TLR, it's just for you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for doing that. Actually, TLR9 uh, antagonists are being used in, in IBD. Not oh, used, okay. but in clinical trials. So I think that there's, you know, you, you have probably something you can repurpose there. Okay. You know, we had we had Juanita a, a couple of years ago now, Marty Blazer. Mm -hmm. And on the one hand, of course, now now that he was the HP king for a long time, he's sort of anti-treatment of HP or eradication of HP as, as kind of one of the many uh, sort of microbiota that we have co-evolved with, quite frankly, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And that in fact, some of these T-cell, T like suppressor T-cell um, subsets might actually have that a preventative effect for a, a, lot, a lot of other things, as you know, like all the relationships between asthma and IBD mm -hmm. and all this when you eradicate mm -hmm. HP. So sort of like on the one hand that happens. Mm -hmm. And on the other hand, I'm the inpatient attending, you're catching me between cases. And we had, you know, Peruvian man who had gastric cancer in, at, at 50 years old, who, uh, who had no symptoms, actually underwent an upper endoscopy uh, because he went back to his country and they did a double on him for no reason. Well, I shouldn't say no reason. The dad had had, I, had had gastric cancer, but in his 70s, mm. kind of an interesting thing. <clears throat> with respect to, uh, in this, with this paradigm, you know how um, people in Colombia, um, in the coastal region, are less likely to get gastric cancer and the Andes are more likely to get gastric cancer. And I've never understood exactly why that is. Does that fit into some of so this? So what I remember, cause I'm, I'm actually on the Vanderbilt External Advisory Board. What I um, remember from their papers is that the, uh, it's a genetic um, basis that the uh, ones in the mountains, the, the, the population yeah. there are more European, whereas the ones on the coast are, mm. have more African descent. And that then gets into the fact that you do have high levels of helicobacter in Africa, but it doesn't seem to be triggering the mm. trigger for helicobacter. Um, and in fact, we're starting to look at that a little bit more closely here. And I, I mean, we're writing an abstract on it now that um, of the intestinal metaplasia that we've seen in our Hispanic or more Mexican American population, that only 15% of them showed any um, you know, positive breath tests, et cetera. But um, part of the problem is we never do the serology. So we never even determine lifetime exposure, which I think is gonna be important. And that's something that I'm doing also. But back to your question, um, the question um, is, you know, there are going to be probably a variety of different polymorphisms, et cetera. You know, TLR9 is just one, IL-1 beta is another, but, you know, we're probably yeah. going to have to pick through that and develop a panel to understand why certain populations are going to have a predisposition to it. Um, I think the same issue as kind of back to Marty Blazer, the, that issue. Um, yeah, it may be that you, it's kind of whack-a-mole, you suppress um, helicobacter in the lower part of the stomach and what that's doing, but you're predisposing to cardiac cancer. And I think that's mm. kind of what he's getting at. Initially he thought mm. it was gastrin, but I don't know that it's really due to that hormone. So awesome. I covered a couple of points there. Other. So I thank you every, very much. We're at the top of the hour. Anybody that wants to remain online, please do so. I, if Dr. Merchant can answer additional questions or put your questions in the chat. Don't forget to uh, get your MOC and CME credit by the link that's in the chat. And uh, everybody be safe. And I look forward to seeing you next week, if not before at Grand Rounds. Thank you again, Dr. Merchant. And hopefully okay, thank you. Thank you for having me. To see you in Miami. Okay. <laughs>